So hello everyone. Uh, we'll speak in English so that everyone uh, could understand the presentation um, because not everyone here understands Lithuanian. And um, my name is Sharunas. This is Jilmas, my brother, co-founder of uh, the company Tag of Joy. Um, and we will talk about our experience uh, and some insights in making location-based AR games. Uh, I will talk about the first half and then Jilmas will continue about the, some other aspects of uh, games like this. So, uh, the company Tag of Joy that uh, we have established and work in is enabling new ways of interaction and gameplay. So we are integrating different technologies including uh, augmented reality, we've tried uh, virtual reality as well a few years ago and well we're looking for different ways to um, make games more interesting, uh, more innovative, and just different. And why use AR at all? Well, uh, like five years ago or six years ago when we started using AR, uh, this was questionable, but right now it's obvious that it will rise a lot in the future, uh, especially after Apple and Google introduced their augmented reality um, libraries, which help uh, add augmented reality in games and apps. And this opens up new possibilities, obviously, but it also has a lot of challenges, some of which we will discuss here. And, uh, well, to introduce the topic, we will um, look at two examples that we have worked on. Uh, one of them is uh, a game, which is Monster Buster World Invasion. Um, and the other one is an educational project, which is Situated Simulations in uh, Fala Sarna, um, which is an ancient town uh, which is now uh, destroyed and, and when you are there you will not see much, but using an app in augmented reality you can uh, find some interesting objects. Uh, so let's watch short videos so that you know what uh, the projects are about. So this is uh, a game that we have developed, and um, yes, um, well, this game is uh, obviously similar or of the same genre as Pokemon Go. Um, we have released it actually in 2014 on Windows Phone, so it was the first game of this kind on mobile platforms. Uh, but uh, we only release it on major platforms this summer, so it's quite fresh on iOS and Android. But we have learned a lot over the years developing it. And now let's look at the other video that is an educational project from Falasarna. On Crete's west coast, enclosed by steep rocky cliffs, is the archaeological site of ancient Falasana. The city of Falasana was built as a fortified harbor in the 4th century BC as part of a plan to prevent Alexander the Great's empire from further expansion. Continued excavations have revealed fascinating chapters from the city's dramatic history. 
Today, the ruins and remains of this unique ancient port are on dry land and difficult to understand for the untrained eye. However, now it is possible to experience the rise and fall of ancient Falasana on location by means of the Falasana app. The Falasana simulation employs a quasi-mixed reality solution where today's real environment is represented on the screen as a 3D model based on photogrammetry. This makes it easier to explain current remains and add virtual reconstructions. The tower would have been over 20 meters tall and stood out as a landmark in ancient times. When using the app, visitors can also explore the harbor as it may have looked in 330 BC. Falasana was left with a magnificent military port. Study particular artifacts in close-up and detailed view. With the letters FA and pictures of a trident and the head of a goddess. Witness the Roman attack of Falasana in 69 BC. A Roman army attacked Falasana and destroyed it. They used siege engines, which threw round stones from hundreds of meters away to destroy buildings. More than 30 catapult stones have been found. This stone has the Roman inscription XX, indicating that it weighed 20 pounds. And consult map view for easy navigation. Yes, so uh, this project is a bit different, but it uses the same technology. So this is an example how quite different things can be made using the same augmented reality techniques and sensors on the, uh, on the phone. Uh, so what we get with a smartphone, what we actually get is uh, some physical features and some technical features that uh, combined together can uh, allow us to, well, you can bring your phone anywhere and uh, phones have GPS so we know where the user is and uh, how they're moving uh, in the environment and uh, the device can be rotated freely and it has gyroscopes, a camera and other uh, sensors and uh, integrated devices that help us define where the user is looking at. And uh, to add that, when we add that together, we just get location-based augmented reality that combined um, with each other, we can get different experiences and different apps. And there's still quite, uh, quite a low number of apps and games that use these, especially games, but uh, that is getting more and more popular with uh, different platforms introducing their own frameworks. Um, so, mobile is perfect medium for augmented reality and um, the problem, the main problem is that uh, games in augmented reality, they, are, they have to be different, so you have to think differently to make them work because if you apply absolutely the same rules that you have applied in uh, other games, in traditional games, then it will not work because there are uh, some key things that work differently in uh, location-based games uh, in comparison to games where you just walk around with a keyboard and a mouse or something like that. Um, so, but you can still integrate uh, augmented reality in gameplay and in experiences. Um, so let's, let's see how we can actually use augmented reality in games. Uh, so you have to find a middle, uh, the middle ground between innovation, um, uh, what means adding a lot of new things into games or apps, and existing techniques. Because if you add too much innovation, then users will just reject it and they will be uh, afraid even to try it. They will not admit that they are afraid, but they will just um, subconsciously reject uh, a game or an app. Uh, but so you have to integrate some existing uh, known things uh, that uh, players know from other games. And that obviously becomes clear when you experiment with augmented reality and you just make more games and, and, and analyze that uh, technique. And so, uh, well, Monster Buster, as I mentioned before and showed in the video, is a location-based monster fighting game. Um, so it uses location and uh, visual augmented reality with monsters overlaid on uh, the camera view. Uh, and it was uh, released uh, a few years ago and it's quite 
popular on the store. Uh, it's one of the most popular games on the Windows Phone Store, uh, even though it's uh, a, a quite a small market. But it was uh, quite it it was very well received there. So. We think that it was well delivered and obviously Pokemon Go, for example, and some other similar games that use uh, the same techniques, they are very popular and that shows that this approach was uh, the right one. And it started with just, with just a simple idea uh, to make a monster fighting game in the real world. And we had uh, three steps that we could uh, integrate or not integrate into the game. So. Uh, we could make uh, walking around, uh, make players walk around with a camera on and just look for everything in in the camera view. Um, the second step is finding monsters in uh, augmented reality, uh, actually seeing them uh, close by and engaging them. And the third step is fighting in AR, where you see monsters in augmented reality and just fight them there. Uh, so there are challenges in all three of those aspects. So the first one is quite challenging because if you see everything on the camera, then you have to go hold the device up all the time, and the arms, uh, your arms will get tired in and like 15 minutes or so. And playing a game for 15 minutes is not that long, especially in location-based games. So you have to help players. Uh, uh, walk and play easier. The second um, step is finding monsters and engaging them in augmented reality was uh, was challenging because augmented reality is obviously still uh, questionable uh, in, in, in tracking and positioning objects in augmented reality. Uh, obviously, this step gets much easier with uh, Apple and Google frameworks, uh, but it still has challenges, especially on some devices. And uh, fighting in AR also has the problem that you would have to hold your device statically for like a couple, at least a couple of minutes, and that's that might be too much. And players cannot move while playing uh, at all. So we decided to not make the first one, the first step in augmented reality, but just use a map and use location to show them where they are and where the monsters are. The second step uh, is done in augmented reality, but what we did is we introduced portals so that monsters just float around in portals, and then if they drift a little, that's not a problem because it, it still looks uh, convincing. And the third step, we just introduced virtual arenas because, again, holding a device up for a few minutes is too much. And, and with a virtual arena, a player can just grab a monster and keep walking uh, further. They don't have to stand in one spot and just uh, play the whole fight there. So just to show it visually, we have a map. Then we engage a monster in reality. And then we fight in a virtual arena. And um, in situated simulations, the educational projects, uh, it's 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 the projects are just uh, meant to recreate historical places or the buildings that have not been built yet, and is uh, it's developed with the University of Oslo, which does all the research. And it has been a finalist in Unity Awards uh, two times already, which means that uh, people like it and they think that this is a good approach and an interesting approach. And it uses location and indirect AR, which means that we do not see the camera view, but we replace everything with uh, 3D objects. Um, and why indirect augmented reality is used in these projects is because uh, when buildings are more or less realistic, not cartoon and not like portals or some fantasy objects, they have to be placed realistically and drifting becomes a problem. And when we have everything 3D, then if the whole world dr drifts a little, it's not that much of a problem because we still understand where we're looking at. And um, the environments still have to be remade from scratch because they didn't look the way they do now 2,000 years ago, for example. So you still have to recreate all the terrain and, and, and even the nature and time of day sometimes. So uh, again, 3D, full 3D on the screen makes sense in this case. 
And it's possible to create fly-ins, for example, if you are not able to walk on uh, uh, into a temple, for example, where, uh, where something interesting was placed before, but now there's a fence and you just cannot physically go there, then you can have fly-ins in 3D space. And again, you would not be able to do that with a camera view. Um, and you can also have time and space shifts, uh, just a lot of freedom uh, with, uh, with the 3D space. And again, to show, it, show you how it works is we see the 3D world on the screen. We see that all the temples are there, uh, whereas in reality they're uh, destroyed. And we can have fly-ins where we go into temples like this one. And um, well, there are also challenges like arms getting tired, but with all the world in 3D, we can solve that by tilting the device a little so the user does not have to hold it like 90 degrees up. They can hold it lower, but uh, the 3D view just shows what is in front of them. So it's still very user friendly uh, and has been tested on a lot of users. But, uh, but those 15 degrees make a lot of difference. And let's go to other uh, interesting problems and challenges in narrative. Uh, communal play and other aspects of uh, gameplay in augmented reality games. Um, so, hello. Uh, yeah, n now we'll like walk through some other problems. Um, the first one is, uh, the first slide is just to show how different is gameplay and interactions in location-based game. So what we have different, we have real world locations and objects. That means we could know if a player is playing in a park, a cemetery, countryside, a city. We, can, we, we have real world time. That means that uh, we should use it because uh, then, then the game feels more immersive. If we, if we use uh, the gameplay, in, in the gameplay, the real world time. Uh, uh, what is more, we have seasons. Uh, summer, winter, with different weather, and so on. So it may impact some, some decisions in your game as well. And we have real-world people. Other players are around us, usually, and they play the same game. So we, we may face some challenges with anonymity, and so on. Uh, I guess most of you heard that Pokemon Go uh, had some problems with that. Uh, so... Keeping those things in mind, uh, let's look at how could we try to construct narrative in a classic MMO game. We may have four main like um, ways. For example, we have we can have quests, uh, we can have cinematics and in-game dialogues, we can have uh, world building and population. For example, some kind of environment details that uh, tells us some background detail, uh, background story details. And we ha can have media external to the game. For example, videos on blogs, uh, short stories on, on, on Facebook, and so on. And uh, can it be used in a location-based AR game? Uh, yes, they can be used, but you should design most of the things with, with, uh, in mind with those uh, things I, sh I showed in the first slide. So, for example, for quests, uh, they should be designed uh, in mind uh, with real-world time, location, and weather. Uh, this brings new possibilities, uh, but it's, uh, it can be uh, challenging as well. Because, for example, if you have defeat a lake monster while it's raining, it may be like ni n nice quest, different quest than, than in other games. But is it really nice to go play outside while it's raining? Uh, for players, it can be discouraging, so you should keep that in mind. Uh, cinematics and in-game dialogue, uh, we can use those uh, to tell a story, uh, but um, you should think about um, how do you uh, connect uh, in-game view, in-game um, um, cinematics with, uh, with like locations that are around the player. Uh, the, same, the similar problem is with uh, world building and population. Um, you can add more details uh, to the real world. For example, you can place some chests, you can place some, I don't know, uh, coins, uh, stacks of coins in the real world or, 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 or other things. But keep in mind that 
different players play in different uh, environments. For example, one player can play in Sahara Desert with no buildings at all. Uh, another player can play in New York with a lot of different buildings. So h how those uh, different environments, real-world environments, impact your visuals, your gameplay, and your, your storytelling? And media external to the game is easiest to use because y you can use any visuals from any real-world uh, space, uh, place, and you can just uh, adapt it to, 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 to match your, your message you want to say. So, w what do we do in our game? Uh, it's an RPG game, uh, but with virtual world, virtual map. Uh, uh, so, we try to tell stories with quests, uh, with dif different, uh, different uh, objectives so, uh, in those quests. Uh, we place monsters in popular and historic places, so players can go sightseeing while playing, and we... We try to uh, make those quests uh, different uh, in, in a way that, for example, as you can see in the, in the picture, defeat a slender uh, six times, uh, defeat enemies six times while playing for slender from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, and, and it's a kind of uh, a way to involve player more in the, in the real world gameplay. Uh, Another example is with situated simulations. Uh, as you could see in the video, th there are some virtual uh, objects uh, that you can explore. Uh, they are placed in the environment, so uh, you can then interact with them and discover some more stories. Uh, another thing is game world presence. Uh, most players can travel far away from their from where they live. Uh, so uh, you can't start uh, like in one location, then forcefully move to another. Like in most MMO games where when you level up, you go to another location, you explore it, you go to a third location and so on. Uh, so one player must be able to play in the same area. Uh, and that means that you as a developer need to support low and high level players in the same physical location as well. Uh, so, s totally persistent world uh, may be a problem. Uh, so, some some kind of phasing and instancing may may help, so that one player sees uh, lower level monsters, for example, uh, higher level player sees high level monsters, and so on. Um, another thing is communal play, and uh, people like to interact with other players, but. Uh, uh, if we have real-world map, as a map for a game, we have real-world people, re real-world persons around us. So we should handle somehow, we should handle anonymity. Uh, and uh, if we let uh, minor players play our game, we should know that it can be a danger for them. Uh, different, another problem is that different areas may have vastly different player density, so we should somehow support different player densities. For example, in a rural area, there may be only one player in hundreds of kilometers, no, not hundreds, but um, some kilometers, and he should be able to play it, the game engagingly the same way as in, in, for example, a capital city of the country where a lot of players. Uh, again, some instancing may help. Uh, indirect interactions could help as well. For example, if uh, other players can play chests around or monsters around, around in the map, uh, uh, so if there are no other players, for example, AI players could place those things, and then you, as a player, indirectly interact with those objects, so it could be a solution. Uh, engagement, player engagement is different as well, because not all people like to walk. That's obvious. And sometimes the ones that like to walk, they don't want to walk because the weather is too hostile. So you should adapt your gameplay uh, in some kind of way that those players could play as well, if you care about them. And session length is another important issue. Uh, because player, pl players need to move physically, uh, you could let them turn 
uh, you could let them turn the game off while they walk. It's good because uh, then battery drain is lower. Uh, it's bad because you need somehow like get him back to the to the game. If, for example, he goes around and he forgets that he was playing, it's bad for you. Uh, so you should solve it as well. Uh, another thing is that MMO game needs constant internet connection, and in some regions in the world, the, the internet is really expensive or not available at all. And we we are lucky here in Lithuania and in most uh, European countries that it's it's quite good internet. We have quite a good mobile internet, uh, but we we get a lot of like comments and and uh, requests from players. Can you make this game offline and so on? But but then you, if you do that, if you make some gameplay offline, then you get cheaters. Then you sacrifice some kind of security and so on. So before you design these kind of interactions and gameplays, you should think about how you handle these things. Um, and in our game, uh, we added a quick fight mode. Uh, it's without AR. Uh, you you can play it on the couch. We use geofencing functionality to notify players about nearby monsters uh, and treasure chests, so you can turn off, off the game and go around and get notifications. Um, and we optimize the game to not use GPS and gyro while it's not necessary. So if, you, if you're playing the fight, the, those sensors are not active, so battery drain is lower. So it's some some headache with all these things, some discoveries, some explorations, and is it really worth it? And yes, we think, yes, it's worth it, and players mostly do too. So uh, here are some like quotes from the comments we get from players. For example, someone wrote, awesome, gets me and my kids walking in the neighborhood. I love the real world application to it, the decision of the developer's part uh, good job, guys. Uh, I think this is the best monster game app I ever played. So when you get this kind of feedback, uh, these comments, uh, it keeps you motivated and walking, improving uh, in the game. So uh, the takeaway of this presentation is that mobile is perfect for location-based AR games. Uh, so why not create more such games? Uh, However, you should uh, care about issues with such games and main issues are technical integration and use cases. You shouldn't overuse the, the AR part. Uh, there are game design problems. You should think about different areas and dif different gameplay experiences. And you should be flexible with players uh, to let them be able to play without those additional innovative things as well if you care about them. Uh, so you should look for the golden mean, use these technologies, but don't overuse if you, if you are creating like uh, ordinary game with like for major audiences. And thank you. And if you have any questions, I think we still have some time. If not, we can just skip the questions and you can contact us on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>